Good evening. In celebration of the United States Constitution and in tribute to James Madison's leadership in its creation and ratification, it is truly an honor to be able to co-host tonight's program with the National Archives. Good evening. I'm Roy Young, and I'm the president and CEO of James Madison's Montpelier. At Montpelier, we strive to inspire our visitors through Madison's greatest legacies, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The Constitution, like the rest of America, is a work in progress, subject to amendment, interpretation, and reinterpretation. Every generation faces circumstances the Founding Fathers could not have possibly predicted, and we have to turn to the Constitution again and again for guidance. It has become clear over the course of American history that knowledge of the founding documents is crucial to improving our nation and addressing the needs of each new generation. The revolutionary ideas embodied in this Constitution are still just as important today as they were over 200 years ago. Thank you once again from Montpelier for the opportunity to co-host this important event. Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual author lecture with Akil Reed Amar, author of The Words That Made Us. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs you can view on our YouTube channel. On Thursday, May 6th at noon, we'll hear from former New York Times White House correspondent Robert M. Smith, whose new book, Suppressed, reveals how some stories made it to print while others are ignored. And on Monday, May 10th at 5 p.m., Bob Drury and Tom Clavin will tell us the true story saga of Daniel Boone and the conquest of the frontier, the subject of their new book, Blood and Treasure. Our partner in bringing you today's discussion is James M. Madison's Montpelier, the historic home of our fourth president. It's through Madison's notes that we know what occurred behind the closed doors of the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Madison was also the last surviving member of that convention, dying in 1836. That span of 50 years, plus the preceding three decades, are the years covered in Akhil Reed Amar's new book on the origins and development of the U.S. Constitution. Decades of debate over the nature of government preceded the ratification of our Constitution and such debate continued into the first half of the federal period. New constitutional questions arose and efforts to arrive at decisions marked these early decades of our nation's existence. America's constitutional conversation continues and through Professor Amar's new work, we can come to a better understanding of its origins. Akhil Reed Amar is Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University where he teaches constitutional law. He's the author of several books, including The Constitution Today, America's Unwritten Constitution, and America's Constitution. His work has won awards from both the American Bar Association and the Federalist Society, and he has been cited by the Supreme Court justices across the spectrum in more than 40 cases. He regularly testifies before Congress and is a recipient of the American Bar Foundation's Outstanding Scholar Award. He's written widely for popular publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Time, and the Atlantic. Now let's hear from Akhil Reed Amar. Thank you for joining us today. It's such an honor to be with you all this evening. It's a very special day for me um, because today is the publication day of this book that I've been working on for most of my life, um, all about the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that preceded it and the Bill of Rights that followed it. It tells the story 
of America from 1760 to 1840. I'm with you uh, today from historic uh, Montpelier, uh, James Madison's Montpelier in affiliation with the National Archives. And it's an especially meaningful moment for me because my parents weren't lucky enough to be born in the United States the way I was. They came over as immigrants. I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And when I was 10 years old, they took me to the National Archives. And I saw the parchment copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution uh, and the Bill of Rights as you uh, can see them yourselves when the, the museum reopens uh, in its historic rotunda. I was 10 years old and then and there I decided that that I want to study these documents to, to learn more about America, um, why we Americans um, ha are, have been so blessed uniquely in the history of the world. Um, and the product of my labors is actually the book that I want to share with you today. Um, and uh, I'm going to be reading several sections of the book all about these three historic documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Uh, so um, uh, it's a little ironic, I suppose, that uh, I'm here at uh, James Madison's Montpelier because the story that I'm going to tell you about these three texts is one that decenters to some extent the contributions of James Madison and emphasizes actually George Washington um, as the more significant framer um, and founder, but most important of all, focuses on we, the people of the United States, um, as the real authors and founders of these great um, uh, charters of liberty. So let's first talk about the Declaration of Independence. Who really wrote the Declaration? Let's consider several possible answers. A, Congress did. This is a good answer. The document technically came from Congress, and Congress did significantly edit the committee draft especially by admitting some idiosyncratic things that Jefferson had written about moral culpability for colonial slavery. This answer has the added advantage of being a democratic answer. The final text was effectively crowdsourced by several dozen impressive statesmen who had in turn been selected by an even broader democratic base back in their home colonies. B, the five-man drafting committee did. This is also a good answer. It has the virtue of showcasing Benjamin Franklin, not just because he himself was on the committee, but also because the committee was the embodiment of his snake, the join or die cartoon, the very famous one that m most of us remember. Uniting, as it did, New England, um, Adams from, uh, John Adams from Massachusetts and Roger Sherman from Connecticut, uh, New York, Robert um, Livingston, son and namesake of a Stamp Act congressman, Pennsylvania, Franklin himself, and Virginia, Jefferson. This answer also draws strength from the fact that the committee members gave Jefferson preliminary suggestions and at least two members reviewed his initial draft before it came before the Congress. C. Jefferson did. This too is a good answer for certain purposes. It's the most common answer given today. It's the answer that Jefferson's partisans gave in the late 1790s and thereafter. And it's the answer that Jefferson himself ultimately gave to posterity. The inscription on his gravesite obelisk pursuant to his strict instructions, described him as, quote, author of the American Declaration of Independence, unquote. But the elder Jefferson gave his younger self too much credit. The obelisk answer also emphasized style over substance. Now, style is important, and Jefferson could surely write, but substance, of course, is also important, and much of the Declaration's substance was hardly unique to Jefferson. So the best answer of all is D. America did. America, in effect, slowly refined and purified the precious metal of the Declaration in an extraordinarily wide and deep conversation between 1763 and 1776. Jefferson was a stylish note taker, not a transcriptionist recording every word verbatim, but a good student summarizing and organizing the key points. At his more modest moments, this is indeed how Jefferson described the document and his role. This is a quote from Jefferson. The object of the Declaration was not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, not merely to say things which had never been said before, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject. 
It was intended to be an expression of the American mind. Harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversations, in letters, or in printed essays. We can now see the Declaration with fresh eyes. The document aimed to declare independence from the king and not from parliament because the colonists had long argued they were not properly subject to parliament. Um, um, the Declaration's punchline claims that Americans were absolved of, quote, all allegiance to the British crown, unquote. Americans never owed any allegiance to parliament or to the British nation. They were never formally dependent on parliament, even if they were connected to Great Britain through a common monarch. In leading up to this punchline, the document targeted King George, the present king of Great Britain, and itemized his many wrongs. He's done this, he's done that. Um, but its references to parliament as such were dismissive and oblique. Um, here's what it said, quote, he, that is George, has combined with others, that would be parliament, to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitutions and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his, his assent to their pretended acts of legislation. The justification for severing all allegiance to the king was a standard Lockean justification with two prongs. First, George had ruled as a tyrant who had inflicted on his American subjects, quote, a long train of abuses, a phrase lifted directly from John Locke's 1689 publication, Two Treatises of Government. Some of the abuses itemized in the Declaration were the kings alone, whereas many others occurred in a conspiracy with Parliament. On this view, George had an obligation to thwart his British Parliament in order to properly protect his American parliaments and subjects, the American assemblies, the colonial assemblies. George, on this view, had tyrannized by giving his assent to the British Parliament rather than vetoing or at least scolding Parliament. Acting alone or with others, the king had wronged his American subjects by, among other things, imposing taxation without representation, violating jury trial rights, um, uh, um, foisting a servile judiciary and corrupt bureaucracy upon America, abrogating colonial charters, inflicting standing armies in peacetime without colonial consent, courting troops to overawe civilians, preventing colonial assemblies from properly meeting, and shutting down American ports. If the Declaration was a mass divorce of sorts, the first prong of the divorce suit was domestic cruelty. The second prong was abandonment. Americans were not leaving George, he had already left them. He was no longer protecting them, he was waging war on them. He had himself thus dissolved the basic social contract in which he promised protection to his subjects, who in return owed him allegiance. In effect, he had abdicated, much as James II had fled the throne in 1688. And then, the Declaration, building to a crashing crescendo, identified the master sin encapsulated by all of King George's other misdeeds and that rendered Americans without any choice but to leave. George had not listened to Americans. He had not even heard their petitions. He had failed to respond. He had failed to converse. Quote, in every stage of these oppressions, we've petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injuries. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. So that's um, just a little bit, a little snippet on the Declaration of Independence, which whose parchment copy, of course, very famously is in the National Archives Rotunda. Um, now a few words on the Constitution, whose parchment copy is also in the, the great shrine of the National Archives. Um, and this is a meditation on whether the Constitution is really Madison's Constitution or maybe something slightly different. Many of Madison's darlings died in the summer of 1787. He argued relentlessly for a Senate that, like the House, would be apportioned by population. He lost. He advocated tirelessly for a congressional negative, that is a veto, over state law. He lost again. He wanted the president to be joined with leading judges and wielding the veto power. Here, too, he lost. He pleaded for broad federal power to tax exports. Yet again, he lost. 
The proposed constitution that emerged from Philadelphia also contained signature features that Madison had not pondered prior to the convention. For example, Article 2, that's the executive article, created a muscular executive branch centered in one person with um, vested, um, uh, uh, centered one person independently elected, perpetually re-eligible, and vested with sweeping powers. In a letter to Washington a few weeks before the start of the convention, Madison confessed that, quote, although a national executive must also be provided, I've scarcely ventured as yet to form my own opinion, either as to the, either of the manner in which it ought to be constituted or of the authorities with which it ought to be closed. In other words, Madison is telling George Washington before the Philadelphia Convention, he hasn't really thought very much about executive power. Now here's the case for Madison as the father of the Constitution, and then I'll give you the case against. Madison was instrumental in precipitating the Federal Constitutional Convention, the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention, and persuading Washington to emerge from retirement to attend and preside. Madison's home state of Virginia in effect called the convention, and Madison was the chief architect of the Virginia Plan that defined the convention's conversational agenda. He prepared for this conclave more carefully than did anyone else. At the convention itself, he was one of a handful of delegates who, with a perfect attendance record, and he vigorously participated in most of the major debates. He also kept the most extensive set of notes of the proceedings, a veritable treasure trove for historians. After the convention, he worked tirelessly for ratification. He orchestrated the successful defense of the Constitution in all important Virginia. He also brilliantly collaborated with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay under the pen name Publius to produce 80 plus uh, essays comprehensively analyzing and defending the Constitution, what we call the Federalist Papers today. Most of Publius's essays first appeared in newspapers beginning in late 1787. The entire package appeared in mid 1788 as a two volume book, The Federalist. These essays were the most impressive and comprehensive analysis of the Constitution available to Americans deciding whether to vote yes or no on the Constitution itself. Centuries later, the Federalist remains the first thing that any thoughtful American who wants to read and understand the Constitution in historical context should read. After ratification, Madison went on to champion a series of amendments to the Constitution, a Bill of Rights that improved the Constitution's substance and help win over initial doubters and opponents. When freedom of speech and of the press enshrined in the First Amendment came under assault in the late 1790s, Madison, who had sponsored the amendment in 1789, powerfully and successfully championed these fundamental freedoms. Freedoms at the very bedrock of a proper system of constitutional conversation. Still later, he served as Secretary of State, then for eight years as America's fourth president. One of his biggest best and earliest set of constitutional ideas about the need for a strong federal oversight of individual states to protect in-state minorities would eventually become a new constitutional cornerstone when the Constitution was reconstructed after the Civil War. Throughout his long career of public service, he was a rare combination, a powerful thinker and a powerful doer. The Constitution was central to much of what he thought about and much of what he did. You have to remember, I'm here in James Madison's home, it's Montpelier, so, so I have to tell you that that's the case for James Madison. I hope I've said it forth with clarity. But now here's the case against James Madison. Despite all of Madison's constitutional service before, during, and after Philadelphia, the stubborn fact remains that the final Philadelphia plan reflected few of his most original and distinctive ideas. Before the convention, John Jay, Henry Knox, and Madison, in that order, so Jay first, Knox second, then Madison, had all sent Washington outlines proposing that a new federal constitution broadly resemble tripartite, that is three branch and bicameral, two houses of the legislature, state constitution. This basic structure was not distinctively Madison, Madisonian. It was distinctly American. In mid-1783, when Washington had barely heard of Madison, had he yet to correspond with him on any issue of constitutional substance, the general, that is George Washington, had privately told a friendly clergyman that for reasons of national security, Americans needed to, quote, call a convention of the people 
invest the central government with more power. Similar continentalist themes appeared prominently in Washington's famous 1783 circular letter to state governors on the occasion of the general's anticipated retirement. And this is again before Madison really has entered the picture. Thus, the Constitution's most notable elements, a bicameral, um, two houses in the legislature, and tripartite legislature, executive, judiciary regime, authorized by the people, rooted in national defense considerations, conferring more power on central officials, and summoning into existence a robust central executive were Washington's darlings before they were Madison's. Nor did Madison's most creative contributions to the Federalist reach or sway large numbers of undecideds in the ratification process. In the moment, Hamilton's and Jay's Federalist essays were far more important and influential. Madison may have been one of the Constitution's best friends and guardians, but he was not its father. And I know, given that I'm here at James Madison's Montpelier, for some folks that then might be fighting words. Um, but let me actually um, try to um, uh, then um, put forth the, my alternative um, account. The father of our country has the strongest claim to be the father of its constitution. Indeed, the two concepts, constitution and country, form one system. The constitution is the country's legal spine. Without the former, that is the constitution, the latter, that is the country, would have an entirely different shape. Here's the case for George Washington. No one else came into the convention with anything like Washington's stature. Common folk across the continent had never heard of James Madison or any other delegate except for Franklin. At best, a typical delegate was known to political elites and perhaps to ordinary voters in his home state. But every American knew of George Washington. At the convention itself, Washington presided by acclamation unanimously and signed the parchment before all others. Uniquely, he got everything he wanted, in part because he wanted fewer things than did some of his more theoretically minded fellow delegates. Unlike Madison, who came to the convention with no clear vision of executive power, Washington cared deeply about creating a strong unitary president to lead the nation domestically and internationally. And of course, he knew that if the Constitution was gonna be ratified, he'll be the first president. On key issues of executive structure and authority, he got what he wanted, a presidency far more muscular than any state counterpart, with an independent electoral base, a substantial four-year term of office, unlimited re-eligibility, a powerful pen, a pair of veto and pardon pens, broad appointment and removal power, military and diplomatic heft, personal control over executive department heads, and more. Indeed, the federal constitution's single most distinctive feature, its biggest and most obvious break with all 13 state regimes then in place with its, was its breathtakingly strong chief executive by American revolutionary standards. This distinctive feature owed more to Washington alone than to all the other delegates combined. Um, Washington also cared passionately about empowering the national government as a whole so it could win the next war and also win the love and loyalty of ordinary Americans. Here, true, his wish came through. Other than that, he didn't sweat the details. Put differently, Washington cared passionately about fixing a geo the geostrategic national security problem that America um, uh, uh, faced. Um, uh, the copious notes that James Madison and others took can easily mislead. Remember, Madison took the notes that basically give us the most detailed account of what happened at Philadelphia. But these notes can be misleading. Washington's voice almost never appears. He did not speak because he did not need to. On the biggest issues, the men in the room knew what Washington wanted and they obliged him. Most of the delegates had borne arms in the war. A third were veterans of the Constitutional Continental Army. And five of them, one from each of five distinct states. Remember, there are only 39 people who signed the document, 55 people there um, at any given time. Five of them were actually, um, had personally served from five different states, had personally served as his aides de camp um, uh, in the war, to wa uh, Washington's personal aides de camp. New York's Alexander Hamilton, Pennsylvania's Thomas Mifflin, Maryland's James McHenry, Virginia's Edmund Randolph, and South Carolina's Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. 
On smaller issues, Washington did not engage because it made little sense to put his prestige on the line in this skirmish or that one. He reserved his power for the major battles. Unlike his experience in the Revolutionary War, he won all the big battles at Philadelphia. In the ratification process, Washington's name alone counted for more than all the elegant arguments of Publius and everyone else put together times two. Um, indeed, his five paragraph explanatory letter to Congress accompanying the proposed constitution was reprinted alongside the text of the constitution and tens of thousands of copies of the document circulated among the citizenry in 1787. The fact that Washington put his name on the constitution and the hope that he would, when summoned, return to public service to launch the new system as its first president sufficed to persuade many a fence sitter and skeptic. His unanimous election and re-election to the presidency um, in America's first two presidential contests attest to his unique stature in that era and indeed of all in all of American constitutional history. Um, and indeed, as America's first president, he succeeds in enabling other, uh, others succeed largely because of him. He's the one, for example, who helps James Madison um, get through various things in, in, the, in the first Congress. Okay, so that's the case for Washington. What's the case against him? Washington indeed personified the Philadelphia plan. Its virtues were his virtues, but so were its vices. The Constitution's Article IV Fugitive Slave Clause, for example, bolstered slavery. Far more importantly, the Constitution rewarded slavery in the three-fifths clause that governed both House and Electoral College apportionment. Now, some accommodation of slavery was necessary to get the Carolinians on board. And without the Carolinas, Virginia's southern flank would be dangerously exposed. But a more far-sighted plan would have used time more cleverly. The document gave Congress power to end the international slave trade in 1808, but not slavery itself. South Carolina had insisted on a 20 year window before any ban could operate. Um, um, but a better document um, that would have nonetheless fit within the, 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 the geostrategic imperatives of the moment would have used 1808 or any other date. 1818, 1828, 1858, 1878, whatever, to phase out slavery more generally, not just the international slave trade. The Constitution could have specified that after 1808 or any other date, the international slave trade must, not might, but must end. And slavery in the West must end. And the three-fifths clause um, must end in favor of zero-fifths, and so on. Several states, including the convention's host state of Pennsylvania, had already adopted various time-delayed laws to abolish slavery gradually. That was the best state practice on the established topic, and yet the Constitution didn't follow that best state practice. The Philadelphia Constitution's failure to put slavery on a path of ultimate extinction would ultimately imperil the entire federal constitutional project and lead to the very sort of internecine warfare between Americans, brother against brother, the document was actually aimed to pr uh, prevent. The Philadelphia Constitution's failures in this regard were Washington's failures and vice versa. In 1787, Washington had not yet become the man that he would be later in life, a man who in his last will and testament would provide for the freeing of his own slaves. Had Washington in 1787 been that man, Constitution might have been different, as might all the rest of American history. More than anyone else at Philadelphia, Washington did have some power, personally, to bend history, but he bent it only so much. Uh, so that's my take on the Constitution. It focuses more on Washington um, than Madison, um, with the greatest of respects to Madison's home uh, here at Historic Montpelier, which is, of course, the co-sponsor of the National Archives of, of today's uh, talk. Um, so now I've talked about what, uh, two of the three iconic documents in the rotunda that I first saw as a 10 year old boy that so inspired me to want to write what, what has just been published today, a book about these and other iconic American texts. The book is a love letter to America really about 
um, what it is that, that we have in common, the words that made us. So I've told you a bit about the Declaration of Independence, which comes more from America than Thomas Jefferson. I've told you a bit about the Constitution, which comes more from America, or if I have to pick one person, George Washington and from James Madison. What about the Bill of Rights, that third iconic parchment in the rotunda? If America, more than Thomas Jefferson, wrote the Declaration of Independence, and if America, more than James Madison, wrote the Constitution, then did America, more than Madison, write the Bill of Rights? Yes. The Bill of Rights was not Madison's brainchild, nor was it even Washington's originally, though both men eventually came to see the light. Madison, Washington, and almost all the other Philadelphia signers had squarely rejected George Mason's proposal to include a Bill of Rights in their plan. This was an enormous political blunder. Americans everywhere had grown to esteem state bills of rights, which had emerged organically from a fertile national conversation at the dawn of the revolution. These state bills of rights were emblematic features of pre-1787 state constitutions, ranking high among the best and most popular state practices. When the Philadelphia delegates unveiled their proposed con constitution after a long summer of secrecy, the absence of a proper Bill of Rights quickly became one of the Anti-Federalists' two best talking points. The other large and incisive Anti-Federalist complaint was that the House of Representatives was far too small too small to begin with and not guaranteed to grow quickly. A written Bill of Rights as an integral part of a written constitution was thus America's baby, born in 1776 and baptized in 1788. In that baptismal year, the Philadelphia Plan had squeaked through several states only thanks to a, a ratification process in which various Federalists had smartly swiveled and signaled a willingness to consider reasonable amendments. I call this process, yes, but. Um, it, people who were skeptical of the Constitution said, yes, we'll ratify it, but we want and expect a Bill of Rights. And the Federalists in this ratification process, in effect, said, okay, we get it, um, we hear you. Then, in early um, 1789, Madison himself won election to Congress only by promising his constituents uh, in open letters, two of which prominently appeared in local newspapers, that he would champion a Bill of Rights. Had he broken this promise in the first Congress, his constituents might not have been forgiving. In all of this, we see once again at work the spirit of America more than the singular genius of James Madison. Uh, so now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, the substance of the Bill of Rights. Um, and then we're going to have, this is all a book all about um, America's constitutional conversation. And we're going to have a conversation. I'm really interested to get your comments and critiques and, and questions. Uh, so now just a little bit about um, what this Bill of Rights um, um, was substantively. A quick survey of the substance of these amendments confirms their American authorship and paternity. Most of the provisions affirming rights of expression, religion, privacy, property, and procedure had previously appeared in embryo in state constitutions and or in the amendment ideas voiced by popularly elected state ratification conventions in 1788. Yes, but, yes, we're gonna ratify the constitution, but we expect some rights just as we see in state constitutions. Um, as in 1787, when the delegates in Philadelphia had drafted the Constitution by sorting, digesting, considering, and compiling best state practices among existing state constitutions, so now in 1789, congressmen in New York sifted more than originated. Because my view of what happened at Philadelphia isn't James Madison just coming up with ideas uh, on his own. He and others are looking to what states are doing, looking at state uh, what are state best practices, and modeling a federal constitution on what America is already doing uh, in the best states, st um, constitution by constitution. Remember, their their state constitutions are already in place. 
the locution that appeared more than any other in the first 10 amendments, what we call the Bill of Rights, was the phrase, the people. Um, and that's not surprising because it's coming, of course, um, this, this Bill of Rights from the people. So it's a, a nice example of a phenomenon in which the process by which a legal idea springs to life often influences the substantive shape of the resulting ideas. Since the Bill of Rights is coming from the people, it's gonna unsurprisingly mention the people again and again and again. The Bill of Rights, in effect, was conceived in the 1788 ratification process by the American people themselves. The preambles vaunted, vaunted we the people. In that process, special conventions um, uh, of the people had unsurprisingly echoed state constitutions with popular roots, um, especially the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, but also precursor state constitutions that had aimed in 1776 to mobilize popular support for revolutionary new state governments. In the Federal Bill of Rights, the First Amendment explicitly affirmed a right of the people to assemble, much as the people indeed had assembled in state conventions to put various amendments ideas into circulation. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments spoke of rights retained and reserved to the people, including, paradigmatically, the right of the people to alter governments by adding new amendments like the Ninth and Tenth Amendments themselves. The Second Amendment celebrated a right of the people to participate in civic militias, representative of the citizenry, and the Fourth Amendment obliquely hinted at the role that citizen juries um, re um, representing the people would play in protecting search and seizure rights. Um, so um, the phrase that appears in more of the Bill of Rights than any other, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth, the Ninth, and the Tenth, the people, is coming from the preamble. The people, the people, the people, the people, the people, because it's that preamble process, we the people do ordain and establish this Constitution, that's actually driving uh, the, the need to to add these amendments. They, they didn't come from Madison's mind to Philadelphia uh, or even from Washington's. They, they goofed on that. Rainy as they were, impressive as they were, these smart guys in a closed room missed some things. The Constitution is crowdsourced. Um, ordinary people get involved. The first thing they notice is they say, dudes, you forgot the rights. And yes, but we'll vote yes, we'll ratify, but we want to see some rights. So it's America more than, than even James Madison that's a real father, as it were, um, of the Bill of Rights. So I'm just going to end now with a little um, discussion of the importance, not just of the people in the Bill of Rights, um, um, but one other important idea. The Bill of Rights came from the people and spoke of the people. So too, it had bubbled up from a great constitutional conversation, and much of its substance um, reinforced various aspects of the right of constitutional conversation itself. What were those conversations? In each of the states, there was a special convention called to decide whether to vote yes or no on the Constitution. And they talked about it at length. They deliberated. They conversed. People persuaded each other. They listened to each other. What a concept. Maybe we could do the same today. Okay, so that's actually where the Bill of Rights came from. People conversing with each other, listening to each other. Now, not all of the Bill of Rights provisions were all about constitutional conversation. There was nothing particularly conversational, say, about the Fifth Amendment's right to receive just compensation when private property was taken for governmental use, or the Eighth Amendment's right to be free from excessive fines. But many other provisions of the Bill of Rights were indeed all about constitutional conversation. The First Amendment affirmed core conversational rights of speech, press, petition, and assembly. The Fourth Amendment's letter and spirit offered special safeguards against searches aimed at papers as distinct from other items, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Um, 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 so, so papers um, were um, specially protected. Now, personal papers surely fell into this category, but so did political newspapers and the like which had been the object of infamous dragnet searches in, in, in Britain in particular in the 1760s. Multiple provisions protecting juries aimed to preserve these institutions as special arenas of citizen conversation and deliberation. For example, grand juries had inherent authority to issue public reports and presentments 
condemning mischievous government officials and, and other miscreants. Much like speeches on the floor of Congress, the words issuing from grand juries would be entirely free from the threat of libel suits. Civil and criminal trial juries were thus themselves important sites of citizen conversation. They're, they're special speech spots. And these institutions in turn, and in time, at times, uh, protected conversational rights of publishers. Very famously, for example, in the 1730s, um, involved in, in, a, in a New York seditious libel case involving the anti-government printer, the uh, now famous John Peter Zenger. Um, the criminal jury in that case had refused to convict the printer, thus striking a blow for free expression. Grand juries had also at times famously shielded printers by refusing to approve seditious libel indictments. The most celebrated recent examples of those involved actually Governor Thomas Hutchinson, America's most famous loyalist uh, up in, in Boston in the early 1770s, who had tried to use seditious libel law to suppress criticism of his administration, only to be met with grand jury defiance, okay? So um, speech, press, petition, assembly are about conversations. There were juries in various ways. Even the second, the papers protected by the Fourth Amendment um, are about newspapers and constitutional discourse. Even the Second Amendment had a conversational angle. Militia, like juries, were venues of Republican engagement among presumptively equal citizens. Whereas unthinking, unblinking army soldiers, who might indeed not even be citizens, they might be aliens or, or, or what have you, were expected to simply follow orders from on high, citizen militiamen elected their leaders, who were typically local politicians. Any militia, militia officer who abused his authority would likely pay a political price when the fighting was over. Whereas typical professional soldiers might serve in the army for life, temporary amateur militiamen came from civilian society, civil society and would soon return to civil society. The conversational norms of Republican equality in civil society recurred within a militia more so than in an army. In celebrating the role of militia, the Second Amendment was thus celebrating a conversational social structure. Okay, so this book, um, which really has been inspired in the, in the 50 years since I, I first visited the National Archives as, as a little boy, um, is all about these um, iconic texts, especially the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Um, I start a little earlier in 1760, I go all the way to 1840, um, and it's a book about the words that made us, uh, the words that made the U.S. that made the words that we have in common as Americans, whether we're Jew or Gentile, black or white, uh, gay or straight, Republican or Democrat, this is what we have in common, my fellow Americans. And the subtitle of the book is America's Constitutional Conversation. And in that spirit, we're going to end our Zoom session this evening with a conversation about um, the Constitution and about anything that I've said thus far. Um, so I'm getting my first um, prompt. Um, what was Alexander Hamilton's, oh, hold on, let me uh, open it up again. What was Alexander Hamilton's contribution to the creation of the Constitution? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Hang on just one second, let me take a sip. Um, so one of my favorite chapters in the book, there's a chapter called Washington, um, but one of my favorite chapters is a chapter called Hamilton. Um, the book is dedicated to five people. Um, let me read you the dedication. Um, and, and then I'll tell you why I'm so enamored of, of Hamilton. And some of the dedicatees of the book, I haven't told them the book is dedicated to them. So, so this may come as a surprise to them. I hope it'll be a pleasant surprise. This book is dedicated to Lynn Manuel Miranda, Vanessa Nadal, who's Lynn's spouse, Ron Chernow, the biographer of Hamilton, and Kaiser Khan, and of course to Neil Kumar Katyal, who introduced me to each of you. Thank you all, jointly and severally, for helping me and so many others see the true meaning of America. So I'm a big admirer of Hamilton. He's born into nothing. He, he's an immigrant of sorts. The way my parents were immigrants, the way so many other um, great Americans uh, in history have been immigrants. He comes, he loves 
this country with um, a special passion. He risks his life for the country again and again and again. He leads a bayonet. He's right, Washington's right hand during the Revolutionary War. He leads a bayonet charge at Yorktown. Um, and um, remember, I say Washington's really the father of the Constitution of the country, and it's Hamilton who's his, to borrow a phrase, right hand man. Um, and in the Washington administration, it's Hamilton who again and again uh, conceives of various um, uh, um, uh, governmental projects that are going to implement the Constitution's vision um, of national security, common defense, um, assumption of debt, a certain funded tax system, a national bank, um, a national military structure, uh, a currency structure. These are all things that Hamilton helps conceive of um, in order to make sure that the Americans will stay independent, that Britain, having lost the Revolutionary War, is not going to be able to, to come back at some later point and, and conquer Americans. So I'm a huge fan of Hamilton. Um, most of you, because um, I know this is a very, very distinguished audience, most of you have been taught that the most famous Federalist paper is the Federalist Number 10 by James Madison. That's not remotely the case. And again, it's a little awkward that I'm saying that here um, at, at Madison's home. No one reads Federalist 10 at all. This, they, these are op-eds, um, these um, Federalist essays. Um, and if you had a really good argument for why uh, people should ratify the Constitution, you leave it to your 10th op-ed, of course you wouldn't. You'd lead with it. And the most important Federalist papers, the ones that are cited and talked about by everyone else that persuade people are not Madison's 10, that's his first one. They're Hamilton's, first and foremost. Um, um, and they're the Federalists basically two through eight. They're summarized, especially in Federalist eight, which is Alexander Hamilton's um, key Federalist paper. Um, and um, in a nutshell, he says, we need to create an indivisible union for reasons of national security. We want to have a, because look around the world, who's free in all the world? Because most people aren't free. The Brits are relatively free and so are the Swiss. Why? They, they, they are self-governing and most other people aren't. Not the, not the Russias, not China, not India, not um, um, Central Europe, um, not France, which is ruled by an absolutist tyrant. Why is Britain free? Why are the Swiss free? Because they have defensible borders. It's hard to charge up the Alps. And Britain, once they created a union of Scotland and England, they were an island nation and they, they didn't need a huge army to defend themselves because they didn't have any land borders. England and Scotland created a perfect union in 1707, and thereafter, England became strong and free. We Americans, says Hamilton most of all, have to create a, perfect, a more perfect union on, on the uh, four score years later in 1787 on the model of England and Scotland um, so that we can, we can be free. Because if, if we have 13 separate nation states, we're gonna start fighting amongst ourselves for who controls the West, because there's gold in them, our hills. Britain's going to come in and play us off against each other, divide and conquer, and we won't be free. So um, that's Hamilton's vision more than anyone else's. He articulates it in essays long before the Philadelphia Convention, essays uh, called The Continentalist. Um, he and Washington are as one on this. Madison kind of gets it. Um, he's, he's not opposed to this vision, but he's got his own ideas in Federalist 10, and they're brilliant ideas. They're worthy of tenure today, um, but no one pays any attention to them at the time. They're not influential. This is not just my view. It's confirmed by the 29-volume documentary history, the ratification of the Constitution, um, which is online now. You can look at it yourself, and you can see that no one talks about Federalist 10. They're talking about Hamilton's ideas, first and foremost. Okay, so um, I hope that's um, responsive to your question. It's a great question. Uh, here's the next one. If Washington was behind the powerful executive of the Constitutional Convention, do you think his later actions as president and his farewell address indicate a change in his views afterwards? No, not at all. They're a perfect vindication of his vision uh, before Philadelphia and at Philadelphia. And I mentioned that I've got a chapter entitled Jefferson, it, excuse me, entitled Hamilton. Um, it's preceded by a chapter entitled Washington. And in these two chapters, I walk you through, you the reader, 
through the Washington administration, first eight years of the Constitution, and show that all of Washington's um, policies, his agenda, his accomplishments, are a consolidation, an implementation of the vision that, that he um, brings to Philadelphia and that he basically um, uh, gets the Philadelphia delegates to, to endorse and then gets the American people to ratify in a year of extraordinary conversation um, and voting in which we, the people of the United States, say, yes, we do to this plan, which we understand um, is going to mean that Washington is our first president. Everyone understands that, and Washington is unanimously elected by the first electoral college. Every single elector votes for George Washington. He's unanimously reelected after people have seen what he's done. And what he's done is basically implement Hamilton's vision. Hamilton's his right hand man. And George Washington, excuse me, and again, this is a little awkward for me to say today, but James Madison opposes some of these things. He opposes a, a bank, for example. Um, he's completely incorrect in opposing a bank, in my view. His constitutional arguments are actually somewhere between bad and preposterous. He later changes his mind on this and signs a bank bill into law. And he's president um, without quite admitting that he was ever really wrong, but, but he was. Um, and so Washington's uh, and Washington's farewell address is all about national security. Maybe let me read you a passage from it because it's another iconic document. Um, so let me just read you a little bit from um, Washington's farewell address because these are the words that made us, that made the U.S., and why not hear uh, directly from the great man himself? And who drafted that um, farewell address? Alexander Hamilton did. Um, a re um, uh, four years earlier, Washington had asked Madison to take a crack at a draft, and Madison did, because um, Washington was thinking about retiring. Um, after four years, he ended up not doing that. By the time he finally steps down, he and Madison are basically not even talking to each other. In the last years of his life, no letters passed between James Madison and George Washington, and he converses over and over again. The person he converses most with is Alexander Hamilton. And here's his farewell address drafted by Hamilton. Um, and um, I'll just read you a passage or two. Um, uh, so, um, The unity of government which constitutes you one people is a main pillar in the edifice of your ind uh, real independence um, and the support of your tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your prosperity, of that very liberty which you prize, which you so highly prize. Okay, so he says the most important thing of all is um, the geostrategic union. Um, Every portion of our country finds the most commanding motives for carefully guarding and preserving the union as a whole. Um, uh, he says then, um, um, uh, um, um, think of all the, the inestimable value you derive from a union, an exemption from all the wars between themselves which so frequently afflict neighboring countries not tied together by the same government, okay? Um, um, this is gonna help us avoid, he says, having an indivisible union, the necessity of overgrown military establishments, um, um, which under any form of government are inauspicious to liberty. Um, in this sense, um, your union ought to be considered as the main prop of your liberty. Um, uh, and so again and again and again, um, he's basically saying the key idea is a geostrategic union. That is the idea of Hamilton's Federalist Number 8. Um, Hamilton's earlier essays in the early 1780s called The Continentalist. Uh, and so Washington's views in the Farewell Address, Washington's policies of pres as president, are a perfect implementation of his vision at Philadelphia. Okay, um, the next one. Um, do you foresee another con another uh, question here um, is, um, do I foresee another constitutional convention? Um, not right now, in part because I think for there to be another constitutional convention, there would need to be a very strong consensus to move our country in one direction or in another. And I think right now, actually, we're pretty closely divided as a people. So I don't see that uh, consensus to move uh, 
in strongly one way or another. Remember, of course, even without a constitutional convention, we can have ordinary amendments, and we, we've had many even in my lifetime. Remember, uh, in uh, immediately after the Constitution, there are 10 amendments that are added. Uh, there are amendments that are added after the Civil War. There are amendments that are added in the early 20th century. There are amendments that are added in the 1960s. What sort of amendments could you imagine today? Um, maybe, for example, an Equal Rights Amendment, I think, um, on the grounds of sex equality. I think there might be a, a broad consensus for that. Why do I say that? Because it's in so many state constitutions. So if you want to try to figure out what the amendments of the future of the federal constitution will look like, look at what states are doing today. States as laboratories of experimentation. My claim is the U.S. Constitution didn't come from James Madison's mind. It came from pre-existing state constitutions. And on issue after issue, they basically adopted best state practice. The big thing that they did that's different than states is creating created a much more powerful um, uh, president than any state governor, and that was because of George Washington. Um, what's my opinion on expanding the Supreme Court? Um, I think nine has served us very well. If you want to hear more on that, um, uh, my friend Andy Lipka and I have a podcast. It's free. Um, you can uh, access it on Spotify and Stitcher and Apple iTunes and all sorts of things that I don't really understand very much. But if you go to akilamar.com, you can um, uh, access it or just put in America's Constitution. That's a pun, not America's. America's Constitution. Our most recent, we have, we've uploaded about 16 episodes thus far. To repeat, it's, this is all free. The most recent episode is all about why um, Andy and I think uh, Andy Lipka is the co-host of this podcast. It's, it's kind of like car talk for con law nerds. Um, and you'll hear um, my reasons and, and Andy's reasons for thinking that we should probably stick with nine. That would be nice and stable. Otherwise, we'll spiral out of control. Um, but there are ways of improving the Supreme Court. Um, one idea that we float is 18-year term limits for justices, which we think could be done without a constitutional amendment. Uh, we generate, believe it or not, 18 different reasons for thinking that this might be a good idea. So listen to the podcast and decide for yourself. A couple of, we have interesting guests. We had the great Bob Woodward as our guest um, a, a few weeks ago. We're going to have, um, we had Nadine Strossen. We're going to have um, uh, Joan Biskupic and Nina Totenberg and all sorts of fun folks to, to hear from the great Jeff Rosen, president of the National Constitution Center. Uh, Neil Katyal has agreed to come on board. So, so for more on that, check out the podcast. Um, uh, so I think we're coming, alas, to uh, the end of our time. I say alas just because I got to be honest, I've been looking forward to this day for the longest time because for 50 years, I wanted to share with my fellow citizens um, my passionate love for this country, a country that, that let my parents come here country where I was born, where, where my uh, brothers were born. Um, and, and when I saw the National Archives at, at age 10, I thought a lot about why is it that my life is so much better than the lives of many of my cousins uh, who weren't lucky enough to be born in America. And I knew even at age 10, it had something to do with these venerable documents, Declaration of Independence, Constitution of the Bill of Rights. I wasn't quite sure what, but I had the suspicion that th these documents, which is to repeat what, what makes us Americans, what makes us us, what makes the U.S. truly united, um, Republican and Democrat, has something to do with these documents. And I've finally been able to put in, into one place my, my, uh, my interpretation of this. My, I think I finally figured out, at least for myself, what makes these documents so special, what makes them so important, what they're all about. Um, so I've been waiting for the, today's publication day. Um, I've been waiting for this for a long time just to share uh, these ideas with you, my fellow citizens. I'm so very grateful to the National Archives for co-sponsoring this event and for James Madison's Montpelier for also co-sponsoring this event and to all of you, my fellow Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Akil.